скряньте в молоне урну, скряньте в молоне курки. And that's when I first met her was when she spoke at the American Academy of Religion, gave her slideshow, and it was terribly inspiring. But I was a younger scholar and I was very shy and I thought she'd just come in and go out and I'd hear her and I'd be very proud of her and that would be that but afterwards she said well doesn't anyone want to have coffee and so there were about 30 of us that sat around the hotel lobby and had coffee with her afterwards and um, one of the things she told us uh, was about her struggles and I was terribly moved because I had not ever known how difficult it was for her when she first came to the States and she told us that she initially had to work as a maid to make money and that her husband wouldn't give her money to buy clothes to go to the Harvard Peabody Museum where she was a research associate. So she had to take her housekeeping money and save it and have the clothes hidden away and put them on when he wasn't home so she could go to her unpaid research job at the Harvard Peabody Museum. And I found that very moving that she was that dedicated and also it made her very human to me that she had suffered the way others of us had suffered in different ways for our commitment to being something other than what we were expected to be as women. Yes, I dedicated uh, Rebirth of the Goddess, which is the first systematic goddess theology. Um, I dedicated that to the memory of Jane Ellen Harrison, Gertrude Rachel Levy, and Maria Gambudis as ancestors. And I think it's very important for us as um, European uh, I think it's very important for women who have European ancestry to learn to acknowledge that we come from somewhere and part of it is understanding our old European heritage but part of it is also learning to acknowledge the women that have come before us. I know my um, black feminist colleagues automatically talk about the ancestors, they talk about their mothers and their grandmothers and I think as white women we're a little more embarrassed to do that. We think that we just came out of nowhere and we did it all ourselves and in fact we didn't and so when I first started researching the goddess I found the work of Jane Harrison on the goddesses of Greece and I felt I had found a colleague someone who was thinking along the lines I was who was critical of patriarchal uh, Protestantism and who was looking for something more alive in her search for the goddesses of Greece and um, G. Rachel Levy, who wrote about the goddesses of um, the Paleolithic period and how the cave was the womb of Mother Earth and that this was uh, some of humankind's earliest religious consciousness revolved around going deep into the womb of Mother Earth. And then Maria, who followed the two of them. I uh, had known of Maria's work before she died and I had used her work in my teaching and in my scholarship, but I don't think I felt deeply connected to her work as someone who would be carrying her work on until the time that she died. As I told you before, I had met her, but I hadn't um, been, I had been so shy that I never really um, called her up and said, can I come talk to you more? Or had never written her a letter and said, would you like to know what I'm doing in relation to your work? I was too shy for that. But when she died, um, I had a draft of my systematic theology of the goddess and I had, it had been sitting untouched for several years because I'd come to a block in my own writing. And when she died, I was teaching at California Institute of Integral Studies. And someone said to me, um, there's a memorial service for Maria Gambudas and you're speaking. And no one had ever called me up to ask me to do that. So it was kind of mysterious how that happened. But I went ahead and prepared some remarks. And I was so moved that night um, to be on the stage with other women who had met Maria at greater length than I had and really knew her better than I did and at that moment I felt that I was also part of a community of women who would carry on her work in different ways, in different, uh, we weren't all going to be archaeologists the way she was but we were going to carry on her work in uh, scholarship and healing and other many different ways and that really gave me the courage to rewrite my book to make her research central in my understanding of goddess history and to see myself as inspired by her and then therefore capable to go on. Yes, I think one of the most important contributions of Maria Gambudis is telling us that there are two cultures in Europe. 
and we tend to think that we have one culture that we came from the Greeks who were the first rational man who helped us um, conquer nature and rise above dark earth through the power of rational thought and Maria shows us that long before the Greeks there was a thriving civilization in Europe she calls it the culture of old Europe and this culture began really um, in the Paleolithic period when people when people were gatherers and hunters and they lived in caves and uh, the women were gathering the nuts and the seeds and the fruits and the plants and they were the men were hunting and the women were also hunting small animals um, people worshiped the goddess as the creatress as the mother of all the living and that this goes back to the Paleolithic times but her work focuses on the Neolithic roughly in Europe from about 6,500 to 3,500 or a little later um, before the Common Era. And this is the period that she calls Old Europe. And Old Europe was a highly developed civilization. Often we hear that before the Greeks people were barbarians and they had bloody rites and they had primitive thought. Perhaps they were unconscious. But Maria shows us that they had a highly developed civilization, very artistic, and that um, it was a time without war. And these people um, lived in small t towns and um, medium-sized cities, and um, they were farmers, and um, women apparently had a very high status in the society. But one of the things that's important about pre-patriarchal societies is that it isn't a matriarchy. Um, men were not subordinate. They had very important roles. Um, at the same time, women were honored, and uh, they also were not subordinate. And the goddess was the giver, taker, and renewer of life. And um, people understood that the three great creations of the Neolithic Revolution, which were agriculture, weaving, and the art of pottery making, that these three great creations were connected to the goddess because she was the one who taught people that if a seed goes into the earth, it can come up again as a green plant, you can harvest it, and you can have bread. Now this is really a mystery of transformation because the relationship between the seed and the bread is not something that is obvious. And how you get it to go into the earth and when you harvest it and how you then make bread out of it. This was a great mystery of transformation. And this is the essence of the mysteries of the goddess religion. Similarly, pottery, where you take clay or dirt you mix it with water and then you put it in fire and you come out with a pot that can hold water and store grain. Um, this is a mystery of transformation. And weaving too. You start with flax, you start with hair from a goat's um, coat and then you weave it into thread, you uh, spin it into thread and then you weave it into cloth and you have a beautiful carpet for your floor or a blanket um, to cover you or clothing to wear. These are mysteries of transformation and one of the important things um, that I think people don't know is that women were probably the ones who invented all of these uh, major innovations of the Neolithic Revolution. Uh, agriculture, pottery, and weaving. And so it wasn't just that they worshipped a goddess, but that women were very important cultural creators at that time. Most um, archaeologists, excuse me, most um, anthropologists will concede that women invented agriculture. And the reasoning is that women were the gatherers. They were gathering nuts and fruits and seeds in the pre-agricultural societies. So they probably, being the ones who were working with seeds, would have been the ones to notice that if you dropped one on the ground, eventually it would come up. And then if you harvested it from the plant that you had seeded, it was easier than going out and finding where it grew on its own. So most um, anthropologists will acknowledge that women probably invented agriculture, but they pass it right over. And this is what's so important about work like Maria's, that it makes um, women's contributions to civilization central. And it doesn't just pass over and say, well, there were goddesses, but they weren't very important to the history of man because man really began in the Greek period. She, she makes us pay attention to this old strata of civilization. 
Um, similarly, women are the potters in most traditional cultures, mm -hmm. and that's because the first pottery also had to do with food preparation and food storage, which as we know, in almost all cultures is women's work. And similarly, weaving is in most traditional cultures women's work, and all of our grandmothers spent many, t many of their hours of the day weaving and spinning and making clothing for their children and for their homes. So it just makes sense that these probably were invented by women. And this means that in the Neolithic period, women had a very high social role. So sometimes people say, well, they had a goddess, but how do we know that women had power? And it's because women had invented pottery, weaving, and agriculture, that they would have had a high social role. So one of the things that I um, wanted to mention is that um, I don't think the old European culture was ever wiped out. And that's one of the things that's so important in Maria's research. She teaches us that our true heritage comes from old Europe and that the cultures that we live in in modern Europe and uh, modern, the modern Americas are an amalgam of old European ideas and symbolisms and Indo-European ideas and symbolisms. So while on the one hand we have the predominance of male gods and the idea that the light is more important than the darkness. On the other hand, in folk religion and in some of our customs, we have echoes of the old European um, symbolism and uh, many of our holidays such as Halloween and having the Yule log and the, the Hanukkah lights and the Christmas lights. These are ideas that are much older than the Greeks and much older than Christianity and actually take us back into old Europe. And wherever you go in Europe, you see that churches are built by sacred springs or in the mouths of caves or on beautiful mountaintops. And these were the places that were sacred to our old European ancestors. And people remember this and they continue to worship in those places. And I think that one of the things that's very difficult for us uh, in America who have come from Europe or come from elsewhere is that we've been cut off from our ancestral lands. We've been cut off from the roots that go back in the centuries and centuries, um, back to old Europe and even back further than that. That our ancestors had carry on memories that were connecting them to the lands where they lived. And yet in America we're not connected to the land. We have national parks and we like to be in the out of doors, but we don't have that connected to our sacred symbolism. And so our religions, the Christianity and Judaism, are kind of rootless in the American land. What she did talk about was that the cultures of old Europe were overthrown by invading groups known as the Indo-Europeans. And we all have, uh, in Europe and uh, in the Americas, we're speaking Indo-European languages. And then U Europeans got as far as India. And Sanskrit is also an Indo-European language. And what Maria did point out was that the Indo-Europeans, um, when they appeared on the scene, uh, were riding horseback. They had bronze weapons. They worshipped the gods of the sky and the sun and the light. And they downplayed or um, looked negatively on women, nature, and um, our connection to the darkness. So there were two different ideologies, one worshipping the sky, one worshipping the earth, or celebrating our connection to the earth, one dynamic, moving across fat, big distances in, with, on horseback with weapons, conquering, and the other one more sedentary, living in settled groups and creating beautiful art. I think Maria herself, when she uh, began to unravel the language of the goddess in old Europe and found that these were peace-loving societies that lived in greater harmony with nature and with greater equality between men and women than the societies that came afterwards, I think she saw this as a hope for our time, that if we had lived that way in the past, perhaps we could live that way in the future. This is also the reason for the resistance to her work because I think that uh, most scholars have a strong investment in believing that our ancestors were the Greeks and that the books that we read in Western civilization, starting with Plato and moving on, Plato and the Bible and moving on perhaps, um, that these are the great works of Western civilization. And she was saying, no, it's farther back. And it's not only that she was saying it's farther back, she was saying that the values that we have been taught are fundamental to Western civilization, rationality, 
patriarchal gods, male, male dominance in society and family, culture and religion, that these are inevitable and also that warfare is inevitable. And I think this is part of how the Indo-Europeans established their dominance by telling us that there was nothing that came before them of value. And so someone who tells us that the Greeks were wrong, that they were lying, that they were distorting history, that there were civilizations that could be peaceful, this is very threatening to um, everything we've been taught. And it's not only threatening to the power of men in our society, but to the way in which we've accepted that militarism is necessary, that the way to resolve conflict, the only way is to have a standing army. And um, so she's really asking us, is the way we're living the best way to live? And it's a deep challenge. And this is also why her work is so powerful to so many of us, because we're looking for models of living in a different way. Of course we can't go back to the Neolithic. That's the first thing they say to us, but you can't, even if it existed, you can't go back to it. No, we can't go back to it. There were many fewer people living on the face of the earth, and we're probably not going to be wanting to give up flush toilets and some of the modern conveniences that we have. But just knowing that we could have, that we have lived in peace, gives us the hope that we can live in peace again. In many ways, it was a golden age and a utopia and a perfect time compared to the lives we're living today. I mean, compared to famine and starvation and chronic warfare for centuries, uh, compared to people being afraid to walk down the streets um, in the cities of our own culture. Um, we have a great investment in thinking we live on the greatest society on the face of the earth. And yet, the only way we can believe that is by not looking around us. So yes, in a sense, it was a golden age. But scholars also say, oh well, they're just being idealistic, they're just imagining uh, something that was romantic, and uh, they're just making it up out of their heads. And in that sense, they, when they say it's a gold, it was a golden age, it's just a put-down. Um, and why, did, why is it a put-down to, mm -hmm. to believe that there was an age that's better than our own? Yeah. I mean, it might not have been golden, but it was better than our own. And why is that not even conceivable to scholars? And they can just dismiss it by saying, oh, it's just a fantasy of a golden age. Because they're so invested in believing that there's never been anything better than ourselves. And they're so invested in not wanting to change the way we live today in alienation from each other, from nature. I mean, they, I think the questions that scholars ask about um, Maria's work um, and the fact that they dismiss it so readily um, is just another indication of how deeply held um, the values are that there's always been warfare, that we can't live in equality between men and women, that we must solve our conflicts through violence. These, I mean, if they weren't holding on to those ideas so strongly, then they'd be able to look at her evidence. But they don't even look at her evidence, so they primarily just dismiss it. And also, um, another thing that comes into play here is um, the dominance of the rational mind. And scholars believe that unless you have written records, you don't have any history. In fact, they're very words that they use, history versus prehistory. Prehistory is defined as before written records. And just the word itself implies that if you don't have written records, you don't have history. You only have perhaps an unconscious uh, barbarian prelude to history. And um, Maria is asking scholars to look at periods of time when we have no written records, to take seriously the physical record, the archaeological record, the artistic record, the bones, the burials, the stones that are being dug up as foundations of houses, and to make something out of it. Um, in my book, Rebirth of the Goddess, yes. I speak about um, the goddess as being the intelligent, embodied love that is the ground of all being. And this is certainly not something that I learned in graduate school studying theology, nor did I learn it from reading archaeological textbooks. I learned it when my mother died. And um, when my mother died, um, I felt the room flooded with a great power of love. And um, from that time on, I've always known that I am loved enough and that love has always sustained me. Before that, I often felt that I wasn't loved enough and that no one would ever really love me. But as that room was flooded with love, I, I just knew that I wouldn't have survived if I hadn't been grounded and sustained in love. 
and that whatever was happening to my mother, she was going into love, and that was enough for me to know. And I think that Maria probably sensed something like that too. I think she had a great love for other people and for the goddess and for nature. And um, I think we're afraid to say it because we've heard so often that God is love in Christianity. And it's almost become trite, you know, Jesus loves little children, and Jesus loves me, this I know. And we, again, we associate that with our childhood, and somehow we think we've outgrown it. Um, but is there anything really more important in the world than love? And another question I'd want to ask is why in our history books do we celebrate war? And do we see the highest cultures as those that are built around war and domination? And why, when we find a culture that lived at peace and harmony, do we say, oh, that's just a myth of a golden age? Do we really not believe that love is the most important thing in the world? Do we really not believe that we could live in a better way than we do now? I hope that people will begin to see the vision that Maria has set before us, that we can live differently and that we can trust our deepest instincts and intuitions, which tell us that there is a better way. I think that there's this split in many women scholars that on the one hand were our mother's daughters, on the other hand were our father's daughters, and following the way of the father, um, we're afraid that somehow we'll be sucked back into the world of the mother, and that this will be a world of irrationality and pain and suffering, and perhaps there's a fear there. I don't know. I think also we should not discount the power of the patriarchy, that they are the ones who are giving the rewards, and um, they're not going to reward us for challenging their very right to exist. And those women who have challenged um, patriarchal religion have often been on the fringes. And uh, Jane Harrison herself, who challenged patriarchal religion in the, in the turn of the 20th century, her works are scarcely quoted by scholars today. And I don't think that women are stupid. I think they notice that. And I think many of us um, feel, as Mary Baker Eddy put it in the 19th century, Mary Baker, Maker, Mary Baker Eddy is the founder of Christian Science, and she said, God must be at least as loving and kind as my own mother. And I think many of us feel that, and um, we're not willing to anymore worship a patriarchal, judgmental God. We're no longer willing not to see ourselves and our mothers as being fully in the image of God. And I think also the goddess image uh, connects our own bodies and our own sexuality and our own creativity of our bodies to nature. And this time of planetary crisis, I think so many of us know that we need an image that uh, celebrates our connection to all beings in the web of life and that will help us to come to a more ecological way of living so that we can save the planet and save the human race. In 1978 I wrote an article called Why Women Need the Goddess and it's been my most widely published and quoted work and um, in that article I said that women need the goddess as an image of the goodness and legitimacy of female power and we've been taught in our Western culture that female power is evil Eve brought sin and death into the world. It was her curiosity or her sexuality that did it. And um, we've been taught to fear our sexuality, our curiosity or our intelligence, and basically um, ourselves. And so I think that women intuitively, when they see beautiful images of the goddess, all different sizes, shapes and colors, fat, thin, young, old, um, they intuitively say, oh, <laughs> I am in the image of the divine. And that's something that we often questioned when we were taught that God was a man and that he picked men as prophets and saviors and he didn't pick us or our mothers. Uh, you really have to ask yourself, it's from a Christian position or even a Jewish, am I as a woman in the image of God? And the answer seems to be, no. <laughs> so yes, uh, I think the most important uh, thing that the Goddess is bringing is an image that gives us a sense of confidence in ourselves as women. And it creates a great metaphoric shift 
because even if the goddess isn't the ultimate reality or put, to put it another way even if ultimate reality is not not feminine but is is something more than that in our culture after 2000 3000 4000 years of male gods um, this just saying goddess changes something um, I think that in Murray Gimbutas's work uh, she talks about the the goddess as the giver taker and renewer of life and of course we're all used to the idea of the giver of life but what about mother earth mother nature but what about the taker of life the goddess is also the death aspect and um, uh, in the uh, understanding that Maria put forward and that is also being put forward elsewhere through the goddess movement um, life death and regeneration are intertwined so I have a growing sense and I think many others share this that the goddess exists whether we create her or not, whether we say the right spells or not. She is the earth, she is in the earth. She is the power of birth, death and renewal and there is a very long history. And whether I subscribe to it or not, that history exists and the goddess as the principles of birth, death and regeneration and as I call it the intelligent embodied love that grounds all being exists in, it's out, and we don't have to create it. We can just stand on the ground and know that we are walking on our Mother Earth. I think Maria's most important contribution is summed up in the title of her of one of her books, The Language of the Goddess. I think her work in deciphering the symbolism of the goddess and looking very closely at how it repeats itself is a very important contribution. And I know in my own work in leading goddess pilgrimage tours to Crete and visiting and revisiting the museum in Heraklion, which has the uh, findings from Neolithic and um, Minoan Crete, I find that her, her um, insights are so valuable because when I first read the book I thought, well, um, is a, does, does a zigzag line really mean rain or something like that? But the more I looked at the artifacts and saw the same images, the same zigzag and spiral lines um, being repeated, it began to make sense to me that there was a language of the goddess there. And it's not something that you can see at a glance. It's something that you see when you spend a lot of time with the artifacts. And that's what she did, and that's what I'm beginning to do. And the more time you spend, the more you see that her hypothesis makes more sense of the evidence than other hypotheses do. I think her other important contribution is her theory of the two cultures of Europe and her um, understanding of the Indo-European invasion. Um, what mistakes did she make? All scholars make mistakes and this is the nature of scholarship. She was a scientist, she was always open to criticism and she wanted other people to start working on the same things and to point out where her flaws were. Um, I myself am, uh, feel that she's weakest on um, some of the social concepts and um, she doesn't talk as clearly as she could about women's role in the, event, in the invention of agriculture. And we can draw together uh, work out of anthropology and sociology of culture and we can show that what Maria perhaps asserts, that women had power in Neolithic culture. We can show a material basis for that. And we can also talk about now with the new book that's come out on women in weaving we can talk about the important cultural contributions that weaving made to culture and how that was invented in the Neolithic and was very much tied with Neolithic revolution. So I think the material uh, social construction, excuse me, I think the, um, she's weakest on her understanding of the sociology underlying the symbolism and language of the goddess. Mm. Mm. But I don't think, I think this can be corrected. I think this can be amplified. And I, I don't think it indicates a flaw in her theories. But she could have been care more careful sometimes in the language she chose um, when she uses matrifocal or gylanic or sometimes matriarchal in some of her speeches. She could have been more careful in the way she used some of that language. Mm -hmm. Could you define matrifocal and gylanic? <laughs> 
Um, well, most people, when they're told that there was a pre-patriarchal culture, uh, assume that it was a matriarchal culture, and that matriarchy must be the opposite of patriarchy. And if matriarchy is the opposite of patriarchy, that means that there were highly organized societies where women dominated men, held them as slaves, uh, where women went to war and conquered other people on horseback and so on. Um, and the evidence is that there were no matriarchies of that sort. And it seems that um, rather than being a matriarchy, we have cultures where there was female power. And um, female power is not female dominance. We have cultures where there was female power. And um, female power is not female dominance. Um, in cultures where women uh, are powerful in the society and where the symbolism celebrates women and our human connection to nature, uh, we find that these cultures are far more egalitarian than cultures that are uh, where there's male power and male dominance. And Maria used the term matrifocal to talk about cultures that were organized around the mother principle, uh, focused around the mother principle and the power of women. And in her later work, she also used the word Gylanic, um, which I don't even want to talk about that, so I'm going to leave it. I hate that word. <laughs> but perhaps the word matrifocal was not the word she, perhaps the word matrifocal was not the word she was really looking for, because she says in her own theory that the mother is not the most important image of the goddess, and that it was an image of female, the female body and the human connection to nature, and an image of transformation and mystery. But the mother, the aspect of the goddess as mother, was not the most common image associated with the goddess. And even when the goddess is portrayed as mother, we should probably call her the creatress because she gives birth not only to human children, um, but to plants and animals as well. And this is one of the most fascinating parts about Maria's work, is that she, in deciphering the language of the goddess, she um, shows us images that are, are combinations of anthropomorphic or human imagery and animal and plant imagery. So you have um, goddesses with buttocks that look like bird buttocks, and you have long neck goddesses who perhaps are diving birds or seabirds. You have snake imagery associated with the goddess and often the goddess's body itself being coiled up like a snake. So you have images that talk about the intimate connection of humanity to nature. And when we see images like this, we often also would say, well, that can't be a divine image. That's less than human. You know, if it's a snake, it's less than human. If it's a bird, it's less than human. But what Maria's taught us to see is that in the mythic understanding of old Europe, our human connection to nature was celebrated, and we can see that birds can fly and we can't, and snakes can go under the ground and we can't. So an image that includes both our human creativity and the creativity of other beings in the universe is more, not less, than a human image would be. Um, Maria's work and the other work that I've done with the goddess has, it really has changed my life. And um, about 10 years ago, I became frustrated with trying to fight the battles in the academic uh, communities that I was engaged in. And in fact, I was diagnosed with the early stages of cancer. I'm fine now, don't worry about it. But I was diagnosed with the early stages of cancer. And I think this was in part uh, the product of the stress I was under and the constant embattlement I felt. And I decided um, that there, mu there must be another way that I could live my life and do my work. And um, I was lucky enough to be able to leave my job and um, move to another culture. I'm now living in Greece. And though I had many romantic ideas about what my life would be like in Greece, and these were not realized, and I did go through what I now call a dark night of the soul, when I questioned just about everything in my life, including my belief in the goddess and my trust in my own creativity and even my will to live was severely questioned in the beginning. But I have, through all of this, found what for me is a much more satisfying way to live. 
One of the things that I've discovered on a personal level is that I don't have to control my own reality. I think as Americans we've all been taught that if you work hard enough you can achieve what you want. Whether that's material success or for those of us who've given up the idea of material success, we still believe that we can achieve the perfect relationship or find creative and satisfying work or perhaps end war and pollution if we just work hard enough. And I think that this is a very wrong idea. The American dream is wrong. And living in Greece, I've come to a much deeper understanding of how limited each of us is as an individual. This has not made me desire any less to change the world and to end war and to end human inequality. But I have a much a greater uh, sense of my own finitude and my own limitation. The Greeks say every day, what can I do? And while there's perhaps an overemphasis on fatalism in some traditional cultures like the Greek one, it's a very important corrective for us as Americans because there are so many things that I can't change and you can't change. And what can we do? We must accept death. Uh, we don't have to accept war, but we have to accept that our own ability to end war is far more limited and that it can only happen as part of a long-term, lifelong and perhaps generations long struggle. And um, I've also found a much more satisfying way to teach what I know. I'm leading goddess pilgrimages to Crete and whereas I once lamented that I was not hired at a graduate institution so that I could teach graduate students who would then go out and change the educational system, I now find that women professors are coming on my tours. They're already ready. They're already teaching and they take what they learn on the tours and they apply it in their classes and um, many of the women who are on the tours are not professors and these women are also eager to learn and they take what they learn and they speak about it in their local Unitarian churches at local community centers, they show slides to their friends so I feel that I am educating very eager and willing students who then take what they've learned and take it right directly into their communities and this is very satisfying because as you know working with students in a university setting can often be very debilitating. You're working with structures that are really against changing vision and I've found a way to work more directly on changing the vision of the culture.